Hello and welcome to the PCM Tech Help Show. I'm your host, Craig Chamberlain, and I think we got the bugs worked out for this particular episode. Uh, this is the first one we're going to actually try to get some kind of actual interview going. I invited Big Nate 84 back to talk about some AV stuff, and unfortunately last week we kind of had some, uh, well, I called it a broadcasting nightmare. So this week we'll try to make up for that. Now, PCM Tech Talk Live is a segment that's dedicated to the subscribers. The whole point of this is to interact with you guys, and you can do that through the pcmtechhelp.com forward slash YouTube page. That'll bring you straight to the YouTube channel. You can click on the live video and actually ask, to ask your questions right on YouTube. So what we're going to attempt to do here today is uh, do an interview through Skype and uh, basically kind of give you a rundown of what of who Big Nate 84 is and what, who he's who he is and what he's all about, and uh, as you know, this is a work in progress, so bear with me. Once we've completed our interview, which usually we'll use about 10 minutes on that, we'll go ahead and get it straight into your questions, and we'll get something rolling from there as well. So let's see if Nate is here on the line. I want to kind of check a couple things here before we get started. Uh, the first one I'm going to do is check to make sure that people can see him on my live stream. Looks like it's going to go through. Now go ahead and say hi, Nate. I want to make sure people can hear you. Hey, guys. My name's Nate. Give me one second. How'd that sound? There you go. Yeah, your audio is a little low, but you're, uh, we can hear you. We can okay. hear you. Okay. Lean into the mic a little bit. That's cool. All right, so we can hear you fine. But uh, on this, let's just go ahead and get started here. Hang on, I gotta stop that audio. I can't even hear hear back feed. Okay, so Nate, <laughs> now I can actually ask you a question. Do I have a list of questions? I know I sent them to you. What yeah, are yeah. you all about? I, I know you have a YouTube channel. Obviously, I, I, that's how I kind of first found you. Um, I found your YouTube channel, really liked it. I think I found you through Eli's community page and uh, kind of found you through there, but what are you like all about? What's your channel all about? Well, I'm so glad you asked, Craig, and first of all, thanks for having me on the show. Um, I'm really excited to be joining you again for the second time, and uh, you know, I still had a blast last week, even though we had technical difficulties, so. Um, yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, was... really, it's really fun. I really love the, the live feature that YouTube lets you have now. But yeah, um, cool. yeah so my name's Nate. I go by Big Nate 84 as you can see. And uh, I started my channel back in 2011, April of 2011. Um, I started uploading how-to videos because I realized whenever I wanted to learn something, instead of turning to Google, I always went to YouTube to try to learn how to do something. And um, I found a lot of poor quality how-to videos. Some of them <laughs> yeah. were really helpful. And some of them were really lousy. Yeah. And, and so... I kind of decided, you know what, I'm just going to make how-to videos. I'm going to try to make them as, as, as good as I can, good production value. I have some experience with video production. I studied film oh, okay. video production in school. And, um, you know, I just kind of ran with it. And now, really, in 2013, my goal is to kind of brand myself as an AV tech expert. Because right. that's, that's what I do professionally. And I figured, you know what, that's a great thing to Make YouTube videos about so yeah, and it's in it's interesting that you uh, it's interesting that you bring up the you kind of just dove into it you kind of just got started hit the ground running kind of thing, and that's really if you look back at any successful YouTuber that's always the same story. I mean, even when I first started, and I by these terms I don't even know if I qualify myself as a full blown successful YouTuber, but if you go back to anybody who kind of got their start, uh, they just kind of saw like wow there's no real good tutorials out here or there was no good something of this out there and that's how I was I saw that there was really no good video computer tutorials yeah and so I was like I'm gonna make these because people ask me these questions all the time and I made them more for myself because then I could remember it and then but YouTube's opened that opportunity to a lot of people who want to kind of create with very low budgets a really cool professional even if it's not high quality, I mean, YouTubers are forgiving, you know. I mean, I'm forgiving when it comes to YouTube. I don't expect a full broadcast studio. That's actually kind of the charm to it. 
So that's really cool that your uh, story started out. Now, what school did you? Uh, maybe I shouldn't ask that. Maybe it's too personal of a question. How long no. did you go to school? Did you do like a full film, two years or four years? No, yeah, I don't mind answering the question at all. I went to um, to University of Massachusetts Lowell, um, mm -hmm. and they actually have a sound recording technology program, and uh, that's actually what drew me to the school. Uh, okay. Believe it or not, I was offered a uh, football scholarship to go play Division II football. Nice. And I actually turned it down just oh, wow. so I could go to UMass Lowell and study sound recording technology. Like that's how that's how much I wanted to go do this. Right. So that that's I awesome. think that kind of says a lot about um, at least what, how I feel about the program. I, I loved it. I mean, junior and senior year, you're in a recording studio for right. the majority of your classes, and mm -hmm. it's not just like a crappy little recording studio. Like it's a state of the art, like awesome API Vision console. Amazing speakers. I mean, it, the the whole studio was actually revamped while I was there. I got to actually volunteer to help them rebuild the studio. So that was a great learning opportunity. For so me. you got a lot of hands-on experience, obviously, because that's like one of the biggest things, you know. When yeah, you're talking about that that, that is that is huge. Um, the hands-on experience was uh, invaluable. Um, yeah. You know, just actually, they don't really, at the program I went to, the sound recording program, they don't really teach you, like, okay, this is how you use, like, Pro Tools, per se. This is how you use this piece of gear. They teach you more theory, and then right. they kind of throw you to the wolves and, like, okay, figure it out. You know the theory. Apply it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's pretty common. Now, not to go too much into your education, let's kind of segue over into, if I were to... I mean, I know a lot of my audience base is kind of like they kind of want to get into the audio, uh, not audio recording, but YouTube-type videos. Obviously, anybody can go pick up a webcam. I think audio is much more difficult. I think audio is up there with lighting and stage lighting, because my stage lighting is a nightmare, in my opinion. But as, as far as video quality is, it's kind of standard. It's gotten so cheap and easy to kind of make it happen. If somebody wanted to get low-grade audio, where would they even start? You know, let's say low grade, like they just want to get their feet wet, they want to try out YouTube, but they don't want to sound like audio is a very important factor with YouTube. It's more important than video, in my opinion. So where would they kind of get their start on that? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And um, I think a good way to answer it would kind of be even sharing how I got into it. So even with my background of like, you know, I, I could feel comfortable in almost any professional recording studio and pretty much find my way around. Um, the reality of it was, the, I think the first videos I ever uploaded were shot with like a Flip Ultra HD camera, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So that that's a very common camera. A lot of YouTubers out there probably have that. Mm -hmm. um, but the audio quality is not that great. So the, right. the first few videos that I I came out with, really the audio quality is mm, not so not so hot. And um, really one of the downfalls is that that camera does not have an audio input. You know, mm -hmm. so um, one of the suggestions that uh, you know, I would I would make is when you're picking out a camera, try to find one that has an uh, an audio input so that you can plug in an external microphone. Um, that's going to make a huge difference, even if it's not a very expensive microphone. Um, right. I, I, are... I got a quick question on that subject. I know there's different types of audio inputs. Mm -hmm. I know there's the XLR. Isn't that the high budget one? Yeah. So like like a like a broadcast camera, like one of the ones that, you know, you'll see on like a news channel or something, that will probably have, you know, a couple XLR inputs. Okay. So that's like balanced audio. Um, that, that, that's top of the line. You probably won't have that with most consumer or even prosumer. What would uh, they cameras. look for? What would they look for in like a prosumer? What so for called? a prosumer camera, they're probably going to have like a stereo mini jack. Um, okay. You, you know, like a 3.5 millimeter input. Right, um, and it really depends on your camera and microphone. There's so many different combinations. Um, for example, some microphones right. uh, need phantom power. So then you have to think about okay, the mic needs to go into a phantom power interface and then come out into the camera. Okay, now is the phantom power really is that's probably for the XLR ones, or does or is there phantom power requirements for the like the con consumer brand uh, mini? You call yeah, it stereo mini. That's more for professional. Um, okay. If you're going to buy like a consumer microphone, right. uh, it probably won't require phantom power. Okay. Uh, you probably just plug it in and, and and you just get what you get. Okay, that's that's very interesting to me because I I had a lot of trouble. I mean, I finally went and got a professional broadcasting camera, 
I haven't even made any videos with it yet, but it's because I had the XLRs and it recorded straight to SD. It set me back quite a lot of money. But for the person just getting up and running, and I agree with you, I bought a flip uh, back when I first started. I tried down that road. I did one of those Kodak uh, Mini HD or Ultra HD cameras. Yep. Yep. And the situation I ran into it was that I couldn't really get any decent audio out of the thing. The video was amazing. Mm -hmm. The video quality was absolutely incredible on it. But, I mean, you know, if you can't, you don't sound good. I ended up having to set up a separate mic and do the whole clap your hands, record the audio separate thing. Yeah, you're so. a smart guy. I was going to even mention <laughs> that as a tip to if you're recording. Because that's what a lot of people do. They'll, they'll record on a, a crappy little camera. Mm -hmm. uh, that this horrible audio, then they'll have a separate like digital audio recorder, mm -hmm. and they'll just press you know record at the same time, and then splice them together in post production. Yeah, it's uh, a lot. It's a lot of work that way. I mean, it takes a lot longer to line it up. And then I used Audacity, which is the free recording software. I got that yep. in my download section of my website for people interested in it. Uh, yeah. I set it up to record the stereo off my microphone, and then I used my crappy camera. But I mean, that's one of your guerrilla ways of kind of getting the ball rolling, you know, if, if you really want to get out of the audio without going out and buying a whole new camera with the, the plug-in mics and all that. Because, I mean, even that will set you back 500 bucks if you got a half-decent one now, I would guess. Yeah, so. yeah there's, 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 a, there's so many options, and that, that's the thing is, like, it really depends on your workflow. Like, it's mm -hmm. hard to, like, recommend a universal, like, oh, that's go true. for this microphone or go for this camera. Because right. it depends on your workflow a lot. Um and like syncing up the audio, in my opinion, if I'm shooting video, it's so much easier. Right. To just plug in like a, a a nice microphone and record the audio with the video at the same time, and then you just have the SD card pop it in your computer and you're editing and you're you're, you're off. right. That that's true. That's I mean and actually there's a lot of truth to that because some of some people might only have a tape camera, so or they if they have the SD at least they have the advantage of being able to drop the video real quick. Mm hmm you know, it might be easier to use a small handheld SD camera because you can just use the flip USB on it than it would be to record on a tape camera you got just because of production purposes. So that's very that's very cool. Um, now, if we moved out of, I mean, let's kind of move away from the XLR mini stereo thing uh, for a little bit and talk more about if I wanted to kind of get my feet wet and learning what you do and what you talk about, what would you say is your, like, number one video? If I went to your site now, I mean, what are you kind of, like, most proud of as far as your your makeup on the videos you've done? I mean, you know, it's funny because um, I haven't done a lot of videos about, like, professional audio and recording yet. I, I really don't know why I haven't done that yet. <laughs> yeah. But I have, like, a whole series about live sound and recording that, like, I'm okay. starting to map out. So my, I guess my answer to you, like, for this specific topic, mm -hmm. uh, check my channel in the near future, and what I'm going to do is break down um, a, bu a bunch of live sound recording techniques into little nuggets, like, okay. uh, you know, have a little video about microphones, about DIs, uh, about mixers, about speakers, amplification, and I'll just kind of break it down so you can pick and choose what you want to learn right. about. But that's coming in the future. Right, um, okay. For right now, my most popular video is how to get free HD TV. <laughs> well, hey. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, you'd mentioned that. That's actually, everybody likes free. <laughs> yes, and a lot of people don't know that the, just because the, um, you know, the signal transmission, the transport, like we switch from NTSC to ATSC, mm -hmm. um, so now, now you, it's a digital signal, but you can still pick it up with rabbit ears and pick pick up the locally broadcast channels right uh, for free right. and it's it's really good with this tough economy uh, a lot of people are you know not yeah. wanting to pay for cable yeah that's uh, what I do I don't even buy cable anymore I just do all my stuff on streaming but uh, I'd recommend they check that out because I've done I've done that for almost a year now and a lot of people don't know about it so that's worth checking out so it looks like they can find you at BigNate84. I hate to kind of cut us short. I know I had some more questions for you, but we're already almost 20 minutes into the hour. Mm -hmm. But uh, I want to thank you for coming out and uh, dealing with my the hiccups at the beginning origin of this. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll hopefully have you back again sometime in the future. All right. Thanks, Craig. Thanks for having me on the show. Hey, no problem, man. Do you want I'll me to see. stick around for uh, questions or anything like that? or? Um, yeah, you might want to stick around in the back, and I'll pull you back up if they uh, if they ask a specific question. So Sounds we can good. Kind of go from there. Probably a good way to do it. Let's see what we got here. 
says, hi, Mr. Chamberlain, and hey, Big Nate 84 looks like they're saying hello. Spec Yes says, hey, Craig, glad you liked my post on the Classic Shell. The Classic Shell is awesome. Classic Shell is the actual, vent, the ability to switch Windows 8, the traditional Windows 8 model, into the Windows 7 Classic Shell, you know, the, the Windows 7 desktop. And you will see in my Faster 8 series that I'm going to be debuting here relatively soon. I don't want to give an exact date. Um, I do implement the Classic Shell as an optional add-on for speeding up your Windows experience because I think the UI is part of that improvement on actually speeding up your experience with an operating system. My philosophy on my Faster series, I don't know if you guys have been to my website and watched those, I have a Faster XP, a Faster Vista, and a Faster 7. My philosophy on those is to improve user experience in a lot of ways, not necessarily system performance. Um, but it does do a lot of system performance ones as well. But you'll see tweaks in there that actually are meant to improve your usability of the operating system as well. Classic Shell is awesome. So that's something you guys, if you hate Windows 8 Metro UI and you want to migrate away from it, check out the Classic Shell. Definitely worth looking into. Rusty Evans says you were a little low, but he heard him. I think you did fine after that. Um, at that point, I had told you. I think you're good to go. Uh, Philly Computer Spot says, sweet, I made it tonight. Well, we're glad you made it out, Philly. Rusty Evans says, hey, Nate and Craig, what's up? Not much. We were happy we finally got something rolling, I'm sure. What do you think, Nate? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Tom Proke says, what software would you recommend to wipe my hard drive? Uh, there is a kill disk application, I believe. Kill disk, is that what it's called? I always mix this up. Yeah, Active at Kill Disk does a decent job. Uh, I've used that before, and then there's, uh, what else is there? It's free. I'm, I like, uh, I, really, I mean, are you trying to securely wipe it, Tom? Because typically, if you want to do like a secure wipe, you have to get a partitioning or formatting utility. Uh, you, if you're going to go to that point, you want to go to like the Ease US Partition Master. It's free. They have a free version at their website. That's e a s e u s ease u s dot com. Or if you go to pcmtechhelp.com forward slash downloads, you can download the Ease US Download or Partition Manager or Partition Master. I think they call it. That'll actually let you do all kinds of customizations to your hard drive and partitions, including doing a complete wipe and deletion and customization. So I'd probably go that route if it were me. So hopefully that kind of answers your question. I'm not sure if you wanted to do a full secure wipe or if you wanted to do a standard just wipe the drive. I mean, a lot of times if you're just installing a new operating system, just go with the default formatter. There's nothing wrong with the, the basic formatting tool that comes with Windows. As long as you don't do the quick format, it'll do what it's supposed to do. Good question, Tom. Uh, Tom Proke says, after all this, we finally got Tom McGawkin's icon off his desktop. This is kind of hilarious. We have a community page where all the community members kind of hang out. we got about 80 to 90 people already. We've only been doing this for, what, two weeks? And Tom had a very interesting issue where he had an icon stuck on his desktop. I think we went through like four or five different possible solutions. We looked all over the Internet. And you'd think that this would be an easy thing to get rid of. Tom, and, um, yeah, he ended up having to go into his registry on Windows and modify the registry in order to get an icon off his desktop. So if you're the kind of person who needs some kind of issue solved, I recommend you stop by the community page and sign up. It's completely free. We're using the Google Plus environment. It's kind of cool. You can post videos, images. Uh, you can do hangouts with other community members. It's really a fun place to hang out with the guys. I've loved it since I've tried to create communities like at least 10 times over the years and never had any luck with it. Uh, this Google Plus one, though, I really love the format and I really like how, how easy it is for me to share community content with other people on my network as well. It's just, it's a really cool experience. That's pcmtechhelp.com forward slash community. BigNate84 is a question for you. Have yep. you figured out the Soviet Russia sound system was? If you can, make a video on how to install car stereo system. Let me bring you back up here real quick. And I, the funny thing is I know exactly what uh, XREV1990 is talking about there because we had a little uh, Google Plus exchange, and uh, he shared a video of some uh, some Soviet Russian uh, kids bouncing around in a in a car, and it was, a, it was just a funny YouTube video. Um, <laughs> but I think that... 
it wasn't the sound system. I think it might have been the car going over some hilly terrain that caused the, <laughs> the guys in the back to be bouncing all over the place. But I can upload a video about how to install your own custom uh, car system to put a sub in the trunk and wire it up and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and actually, and actually, Big Nate is a community member. So if you guys swing at by the community and ask questions, you can actually tag and put the plus, you know, the plus on your keyboard and put Big Nate eighty four, and then post your message. It'll notify him of your question. That's another great feature of Google Plus. Yeah, so, use me, use me as a resource. I'd love to uh, chime in. Yeah, yeah, I'm just giving away your services now, Nate. Just so you know. All right. <laughs> just so you know, it, just don't. It, I, Hopefully you'll make some money on it. You might just be a volunteer AV guy, but hey, it's fun. Uh, Rusty Evans says, I got a Logitech 910 with a built-in mic, HD quality, uh, and those are pretty sweet. Now, when you say HD quality, Rusty, do you actually get HD quality audio? I would be inclined to say probably not, but it's amazing what kind of video you can get out of these, these webcams now. The Logitech 910 in particular is exceptional in its video quality. I cannot believe the quality of video you can get out of these little cameras for like $80. It's unbelievable. That's a good one to look into. Red1990X says, Mr. Chamberlain, what do you think about Revo Oninstaller Pro? Um, I'm kind of weird about Oninstaller utilities because in 90% of the cases, I think Windows Oninstaller does an adequate job of uninstalling software. But for the other 10%, like if it's a big software package like an antivirus or something I mean sometimes uninstallers help you out I mean like if you have an issue with it not properly uninstalling then you then third-party applications can make a difference in whatever your situation is so I'm kind of I, I kind of go both ways with those I don't have one on my computer I haven't ever really needed one because whenever I have trouble uninstalling software usually I can reinstall it uninstall it again or there's like a removal tool on the internet for that particular software package. So, but hey, we like free software. That uh, is it. Oninstaller Pro not free? Because hang on a second, I'm gonna look that up. Revo Oninstaller Pro. It's got a lot of uh, stars on its reviews. Let's see if they have a free version. Yeah, I mean, I guess it does streamline the whole process of uninstalling applications, but I have, have, have a lot of people had problems. Yeah, here's the freeware version. It it does cleaning tools and basic uninstallations, it looks like, and then you have all the other professional. I, I wouldn't pay for that if it were me. I I think there's too many good free tools out there to to pay for that. So personal preference. Charles Hull says, what exactly is CPU? Uh, CPU is a central processing unit, and there's a whole bunch of transistors in it, and essentially its job is to flip on and off at however many millions of cycles or billions of cycles per second it's been engineered to do that at. When you write an application in like a programming language like C++ or C Sharp or whatever your language might be, it goes through something called a compiler, that compiler actually takes that code and translates it into something called machine language or assembly language. That language is something that your processor will understand. We're talking, if you printed it out, probably millions of pages, depending on the size of your program, of ones and zeros, okay? Those ones and zeros are passed through a processor. The processor switches them on and off at however many cycles per second it's rated for, and that's why you get faster or slower processors, because some of them can only process that information so fast. So essentially, that's all it does. But there's a lot more factors into computer speed than processor speed, because there's also things that are transferring information to the processor and from the processor. There's also the proximity of that information or the physical proximity of that. There's your obviously physical memory or random access memory that does the data transfers as well and holds on to information while it's being transferred. So there's a lot of things going on in the system. But a central processing unit, its basic function is to switch on and off a lot <laughs> and communicate with the, the, the BIOS, the system BIOS, which we can probably have a whole dissertation on, on that if we really wanted to. Um... 
Tom Walla says, Derek's boot and nuke. That's actually a really good utility as well. Boot and nuke is actually known for secure erasing. Uh, sometimes you can actually, you have to do something like a zero sector wipe, it's called. And what that does is if you want to do a secure wipe is it'll just wipe, it'll wipe the drive once, but then it'll start writing zeros to all the sectors on the drives. And if you really want to be secure, you have to do that like seven or eight times to actually finally eliminate the old data on the tape. So it really depends on how thorough you want to be. But honestly, the only way to really officially wipe a hard drive is to destroy it. I mean, really, if you want to make sh absolutely sure nobody gets it. So that's a good software package. Good recommendation, Tom. Tom Proke says, just a clean wipe. I have EaseUS. EaseUS will work fine for wiping them. Just make sure you do the full format, not the quick format. Uh, and your Windows or your software utility will work fine for that as well. Nature, Nature Nerd 1000 says, how do you fix Windows updating failures? All the updates are successful except one. I have to do all the updates again. I can't even use that computer, Windows 7 Starter Edition. Now, this is depending on your error code on that particular operating system. Like, do you, what update is it, first of all? Because a lot of times you might have to uninstall the software that it's trying to update and reinstall it. So if it's trying to patch, for example, uh, .NET Framework 2.0, you can uninstall .NET Framework 2.0, then go back online and download .NET, Work Frame, .NET Framework 2.0 and reinstall it. So it really depends on what you're running into, because they have a KB code for the update. Uh, if you swing by the community page and you post the KB update you're having trouble with, I'll be happy to kind of, me or one of the community members will be happy to kind of figure out, hopefully, what exactly is causing your update issue. I had a similar issue on a Windows X machine, XP machine three days ago, and it was a buddy of mine's, and he could not download any updates. I had to go online and manually download his service pack and install it. For some reason, automatic updates wouldn't do it. But after I manually installed the service pack, all of a sudden, all of his updates magically started working again. So it really just depends on the situation. But usually there's a solution to it. Good question. Barry Hollenbach. For Big Nate, what is better, a digital soundboard or an analog soundboard? Let's transition this one over to Nate and find uh, out. Because I don't. Barry know. Hollenbach. That is a very good question. Um... And it would really depend on the application. Uh, if I am picking out audio equipment for a high-end recording studio, I personally would pick an analog board um, because it keeps the sound um, from being converted and reconverted and, and converted again. So whenever the audio comes into the board, it's going to be analog because it's coming from analog microphones. But if it's a digital board, there's going to be analog to digital converters on the preamp and it's going to convert it to digital. And then it's going to get routed, and it, it might... depends on how many times it come, the audio comes in and out of the board, but every time it leaves and goes, goes back to an analog processor, a compressor, an EQ, a reverb that is analog, it's going to have to be converted again. And every time it's converted, it loses a little bit of signal quality. Um, so I guess to answer your question, <laughs> the, my favorite board is an analog board that's digitally controlled. Uh, they're very expensive, that makes sense. Uh, but you can program all your settings, and, and it has memory, and it can recall settings and everything digitally, but the audio path actually stays analog. Um, see, the see. API Vision console I had at school, well, I didn't have it, but I got to use it at school. Uh, that That's what they chose. So um, That's actually very interesting. Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm just making sure. Um, so when you actually are working with a digital audio board, it converts the signal from, and I guess that makes sense, I never really thought about it, it converts the signal from analog to digital, and then of course it's got to convert it back to analog when it's outputting to wherever you're going to. I wasn't aware right. of that. Right, so if it's a really cheap digital board and it has horrible analog to digital and digital to analog converters, uh, I, I probably wouldn't go for that. Um, like Mackie makes some, some like low-end digital digital boards, they also make some some low-end analog boards, hmm. and you see those a lot at houses of worship and theaters, mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't I wouldn't say, you know, digital's bad or analog's bad. I, I think it depends on your taste, it depends on what you're going for, and, and, and how your signal flow is set up. That's interesting. I, I wasn't even aware of that. So is that what a, a DAC is? 
Yeah, digital to analog converter, DAC. Oh, okay, so that's what they were talking. That's yeah. what those audio nerds were talking about. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. I'll see if they have any more here. Let's keep going. I think we're, we're making good progress here. We're not. We're kind of zinging through these, actually. Hopefully, we keep getting a stream of questions. Usually, I have too many at the end of the conversation, and we lose track of time, and we got to push it onto a whole new network and everything. Here, I'm having trouble even switching my signal. Mm. All right, here we are. We're back. Good question. Good answer. Cool. I wasn't aware of that. Learn something new every day. Always a good thing. For, okay, your thoughts on Bluetooth devices, Tom, Tom that's a good question. Uh, Bluetooth drives me absolutely insane, okay? Bluetooth is like the most over-marketed uh, communication protocol, I think, almost in existence. I mean, they, kind of, they, they really upsold it up. I mean, oversold it. It's not really that reliable of a technology, and anybody who's owned a Bluetooth device can attest to that, unless you're, like, within five feet to ten feet, you're usually not getting anything. I mean, and it's just, it's not always a good experience, but of course it depends on the device as well. Uh, I've had bad luck with Bluetooth keyboards. I've had bad luck with Bluetooth, a really bad luck with Bluetooth headphones. Never go that route, and I'm sure um, that Nate can attest to that as well. When you're streaming audio wirelessly like that over a device, you're never going to get anything near a wired experience, especially for music and things like that. Mm -hmm. I think I overpaid for a Bluetooth headset thinking the convenience of not having the wire going up to my headphone, and it just, the audio was terrible. It was terrible on it. And driver's issues, I get all kinds of driver issues with Bluetooth, unless you're on a Mac. I'm sure you've had a much more positive experience with drivers. But as far as Windows, Windows drivers are concerned, I've had a lot of bad luck with Bluetooth, even after Windows 7 and 8. I just don't think it's it's stable for as long as it's been around. I mean, and to be honest with you, there's better wireless protocols out there now that I think are more cost-effective. I think the only thing I've had a good experience with on Bluetooth is like that earbud thing you guys see me wearing. I have that for my phone. I've had a good experience with that. It's done a decent job. But the audio quality doesn't need to be severely high. I mean, I'm just doing phone calls. So if you're doing something like that, then of course you're going to have a better experience. But if you're trying to get any kind of entertainment value out of it or replace any kind of other device with it, it's just I haven't had very good luck with them and I've, I'm not really a big fan of it. Not a big fan of that protocol. I, and I don't think it's going to be around much longer, to be honest with you. Hmm. Maybe, for, maybe for the actual headphones, they'll always be around because it's gotten so cheap to make them, but for a lot of other things, I don't know. Tom Proke says, I have the same t-shirt. You like that? I didn't buy that for myself. Somebody bought that for me. I don't know if I should be offended or take that as a compliment. Vio XP Tech says, do you run the whole PCM Tech website and videos by yourself? <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's been a slow time coming. Yeah, I, I do it as a, it's a side thing. I never really, here's the problem with taking it as a career. And, I, and I've talked to a number of people like, oh, you should do this full time or whatever. The problem with doing something you love full time is you, you risk it being a job. And so the great thing about doing it part time is that it's always fun. Because I don't have to do it every day to make a living or to make money or whatever. It's something I do for a good time. It's an awesome hobby. And I can make some money doing it, which is awesome. But yeah, I've always loved web design. I've always loved entertainment. I've always loved... This was kind of a culmination of a lot of things I just loved. Huge movie guy, huge tech guy, huge video game guy. Loved web design. Hated programming. Then WordPress came out, so I was all happy. Because I never had to actually program to build my website and manage it. Uh, not a big graphics designer, but WordPress themes fixed that problem. Um... But yeah, I ended up, I, I mean, this is like, you're looking at like three and a half years worth of just kind of trial and error, actually. And any business guy or anybody who's kind of even gotten any kind of thing going on a regular basis, that's what, that's the honest truth. We don't know what we're doing half the time. <laughs> We've just tried so many different things that we eventually find something that kind of works for us. Works for our schedule, works for our audience, works for... All kinds of stuff. 
and it's just it's a it's a fun experience. But yeah, I do I do manage it all on my own, and it's not that overwhelming. WordPress takes a lot of the headaches out of website management. In videos, YouTube takes a lot of the headaches out of that. Really, it's kind of cool where technology's gotten. Uh, it's gotten to the point where it's gotten so cost effective, and the tools have gotten so sophisticated and so low cost. I mean, if I wanted to create a show like this, what, 15 years ago, I would have had to have a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, half a million dollar budget and investors and all kinds of crazy stuff. And infrastructure, I'd have to pitch an idea. Now I can buy, I think I'm running on a hundred dollar, it's a hundred dollar microphone and a hundred dollar webcam. Two hundred dollars in hardware. And I got a laptop, but I could probably run this show on a, what a, maybe $300, $400 laptop. I got a full production suite for less than $1,000. And all my bandwidth is free. Oh, I guess I got my internet connection. So, but yeah, it's it's kind of awesome where everything's gotten. And it's only going to get cheaper and easier. So, Reb1990X says, is there any risks involved in using Bluetooth? This is kind of like a, a health question that I don't want to be sued for, but... I don't think there's any verified risks. The FCC has verified it. So a lot of stuff, it's going to go back to the same argument for like cell phones are the cause of brain cancer. And, and these are all very serious issues. I'm not nearly in depth enough to give you an educated, informed opinion on that because I don't want to give you misinformation. But I have yet to see something that I would call strong, significant evidence that tells me you need to stop using this, for Bluetooth, at least. I mean, obviously, I looked into it before, but, I mean, who knows? Overuse of a lot of things can cause all kinds of problems. It's hard to know the exact root cause, and then it's all masked in lawyers and medical jargon, and a lot of people like to just create scares so that they get ratings up. They're like, oh, no, cell phones kill people. And then they'll create a news article and they'll get one scientist on there who they paid, you know, who's on their payroll. And they'll, I mean, that happens too. So it's really hard to determine anymore what's good and bad for you. Uh, Syrian Moon says, I have a problem with Windows 8. I cannot connect to the internet by cable, Ethernet. Only the Wi Fi is working. And when I click on the repair of the network, nothing shows up. That's a pretty common side effect of your IP not being said to DHCP. That's a dynamic host control protocol. Very easy to set it to that. If you're running Windows 8, I don't know how easy it is. You know how to get to your uh, control panel? I believe you bring up your Metro UI and you type in control panel. Okay? And I'll try to walk this, this through with you. The control panel should bring up the traditional Windows 7 control panel. You're going to go to networking and internet, and you want to go to, where are you at? On the left-hand side, we want to view our network connections. Oh, yeah, let's do view network computer and devices. That's on the right-hand side there. Nope, that wasn't it. Go back. <laughs> do network status and tasks. Yeah, you have to go through, like, three windows. So you do network... Control panel, networking and internet, networking and sharing center. Then on the left-hand side, you have to click change adapter settings. Now you've finally gotten to a screen that is logical. You want to right-click on local area connection and select properties. And then you want to double-click on your internet protocol, TCP, IP, IPv4. You want to make sure it's set to obtain an IP address automatically or obtain a DNS server address automatically. Some viruses and malware will go in and change that. Uh, sometimes it's gone in and modified for connecting to different networks. Uh, sometimes it's modified accidentally. But that's the most common reason for that not working. Uh, but you should check to see if you're getting any lights, little flashing lights after you've done that on your network card too, because network cards do fail. They are electronic devices. So give that a shot. Let me know how it goes. Swing by the community page if it doesn't work for you. And we'll see how it goes. Rev1990X asks, Big Nate, back in your days, have you ever used Meta Recorder software? I don't know if he's calling you old or what's he what's he saying there, back in your days? <laughs> I don't know what you mean by back in your days, but uh, I'll let that one slide. I'm not that old. I'm still in my 20s. Uh, yeah, I, I've never used that software, um, Metacorder. It looks like it's a field recording software uh, for Mac. Uh 
Don't know. We've never tried it before. Um, your guess is as good as mine. Sorry, I can't what, offer. What What did you do for like field? Rec- what do you use for field recording? Let's say you don't. You know, you're not a Mac guy. What did you use for PC? Do you even know what we'd use? Um, I think I would probably use something. Uh, they They make like little mini mixers that you can actually like wear over your shoulder, and they have phantom power, so you can have like a fancy shotgun boom mic. Mm-hmm. And what you what you would do is you'd have like a fancy mic that you'd hold up, you know on a stand, and then you, you'd, you'd plug that into your little mixer interface, and then that would go directly into the camera or into an analog or, or digital oh, okay. digital recorder. Uh, that's typically how they would do it uh, okay. on site. Okay, and then the next question is actually for you as well from Barry Hollenbach. He says, uh, what would be best for a DJ in analog or digital? It's at least related. Okay, so maybe he's going. I'm thinking back to his first question about which is better, digital soundboard or analog soundboard. It sounds like, you know, he's giving me another piece of information. Like maybe for a DJ, what would be best? And um, you know, I would say either or for DJ because the DJ nowadays. I mean, let's be honest. DJs, the the hardcore DJs use turntables. But if you've been to a wedding in the past two years, you've seen a laptop yeah. or two two laptops, and they just you know, use iTunes and they play off their computer. So, right. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't think it would really make a big difference one way or another because there's not going to be multiple, you know, conversions. You're not going to come into the mixer, go out to a compressor, back into the mixer again, and be going through all these conversions where audio is degraded over time. Right. So I don't, I don't think it would be a big factor. It, well, it's an interesting. It brings up the original thing we were talking about. There's so many different situations and circumstances. It really just kind of depends on, you know, as a DJ, what what do you want to accomplish and what do you like to do as a DJ? Yep. Right? Yeah. I think that's that's totally accurate. It just depends on your your system, what you can afford, and uh, your workflow. There's there's so many different options as a DJ. So many cool tools out there, you know, to make your life easier. Okay, cool. Uh, let me bring up here and we'll go ahead and go to the next question. I'm glad you stuck around because I wouldn't have been able to answer these questions. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Uh, Rev1990X asks, what do you think of the Sony DSC-HX100V? I have one, but I wish there was a 24 frames per second hack for it. Well, if you want 24 frames per second, you must be trying to make a movie, an actual full-length movie, because that's the standard frame rate for what you would call a cinema film. Uh, I could see why it's not. It looks like it's actually more of a commercial or consumer camera. This is actually just, wow, that, that records the video, huh? It's an SLR, it looks like. Well, see, that's kind of interesting. So you're shooting a movie with an SLR camera, or video with an SLR camera. I'm kind of surprised that it even offers you 30 frames a second. I'm kind of wondering what the resolution options are on it. Um, it might do full 1080p. I didn't really look at it. Uh, I don't know. I, I've never really used an SLR for that. The great thing about SLRs is the lens. I mean, you get... You get really incredible photography out of a thing like that because the problem with the small handheld cameras like the flips we were talking about is that you run into the lens being so small that you get really bad zooming, you get really bad, uh, what's the word for it I want to say, focus, I guess is probably the one of the worst elements of that, and you just don't get enough light. That's why most smaller handheld cameras, they strongly suggest you shoot in high light circumstances and situations. You try to avoid low light settings. Now, uh, actual SLR camera or something like that will give you the option of adjusting the aperture, how long the iris stays open, things like that, and they'll give you kind of more flexibility on that. As for filming with one, it's not designed to do it. I couldn't imagine it gives you a lot of flexibility with that. You'd probably run into an audio issue on that as well because it probably uses an embedded mic. Unless it has one of those mini AV connectors we were talking about earlier as well. Then maybe you can get an external mic for it. Maybe you'll be set. But uh, as for a 24 frames per second, you can kind of fake that with a video editor. Uh, I mean, you could probably capture the video in 30 and depending on your video editor, you could probably output the video to 24. Like, for example, the software I'm using now is XSplit. I'm using that to broadcast this live capture. I can go in here and set my output frames per second to 24 frames per second. So it's capturing my image 
to my computer, my computer's reprocessing that image and outputting it in a different format and resolution. So that might be a good workaround for what you're trying to accomplish. If you're trying to shoot an actual movie movie, you can't really do that with 30. It'll look like uh, 30 frames per second will look like um, a home movie. You know, like the the hand cam, you'll see a lot of the shaking, and it just won't have the same flavor. It's it's kind of hard to, to explain it, but once you've seen it, that's why home cameras look so much different than uh, professional 24 frame cameras. So hopefully the software will help you with that. A couple, I don't really know of any good free video software yet. I know there are some open source ones. Uh, Cyberlink Power Director is a good one. I use that for quite some time on my video editing. Um, it's decently priced. I think you can get it for like thirty or forty dollars. A lot of them come free. My, oh, Windows Movie Maker might be able to do it. I, I I've used Windows Movie Maker a lot actually, especially with the new one on Windows Seven and Eight. If you get the Live Essentials, Windows Live Essentials, the new Windows Movie Maker is pretty decent. So I mean, for being packaged with Windows, you might be able to accomplish what you want with that. So, good question. Charles Hole asks, is there a way to make Mozilla Firefox faster? Well, it depends on your definition of faster. I get this question a lot. A lot of people ask me, hey, how can I make my internet faster? Um, you really, there's, I mean, there's a lot of tweaks and adjustments you can make to your protocol and your operating system that can kind of boost the way your computer handles your bandwidth. Well, I've, I have yet to see a, a confirming tweak or adjustment that gives you a significant boost, and that's kind of uncomfortable to me. So if you're looking to speed up your Internet, how fast your Internet is going, you can't really do that through your browser. But if your browser is running slow, then there are a couple things you can do in Firefox. I mean, you can switch to Chrome, but if you're actually married to Firefox, there's a couple of all Firefox alternatives that still use plugins. Um, trying to think of it. Uh, one of them is called Minefield, Mozilla Minefield. That's one of them. And there was another one we talked about. What did the community say? Hopefully they can, they can fill in the blank on this. The community had mentioned that there was another Microsoft not Microsoft, but Mozilla product that's for a browser. And somebody had mentioned it just last week. It might have been Tom. It might have been Reb. I can't remember who it was. But if they can go ahead and post that again for me, I'd like to share it. But uh, that might be another route to take because they're more lightweight. And uh, you can always uninstall a lot of your plugins. The more plugins you have, the longer it'll take for it to render pages. That's that's pretty common. It depends on what your plugin does, what the behavior of it is. So there's a number of different ways you can do it. Nature Nerd 1000 says, how do you stop worm or bot viruses from spreading and infecting all your computers if it gets through your security software? Well, you disconnect it from your local network is the first thing you want to do. You don't want to have it on the same network as all of your other computers. Second thing you want to do is try to boot in safe mode. For those of you who don't know how to do that, I had a video on it. You press F5 before your splash screen, the Windows XP or 7 or Vista splash screen. Try to boot in safe mode and run your tools in that. If you go to my website, pcmtechhelp.com forward slash downloads, I have a whole section called anti-malware. If you look at the scanning tools, these tools are standalone scanners. You can run those in safe mode. I recommend if you have a virus or know you have a virus, try to run Malwarebytes anti-malware. Try to run ESET NOD32 online scanner. Try to run the Kaspersky scanning tool. These are all free tools that the vendors have provided to people and see if you can't eliminate it that way. If it finds it and eliminates it, then you're probably safe to reconnect it to your network. Uh, if it doesn't find it, then you're looking at maybe pulling the hard drive out of it, putting it in another computer as a secondary and running like a, a secondary scan, because usually if it's not a primary drive, it won't launch any viruses. So that's another real popular way to do it. So if you install it as like a secondary hard drive on another system, you can run a antivirus scan on it from a remote machine or that local machine instead. So it's another pretty popular way to do it. If you have any other problems, swing by the community. We'll see if we can get you taken care of. Uh, Tom Proke says, I have Arctic P311. They work great, and yes, driver issues. I'm guessing this is a Bluetooth device, Tom, since you had asked me the Bluetooth question earlier. Arctic 311 
is yes, it's a pair of Bluetooth headphones, and, and yeah, I mean, I run into the same problem. I, I just you either need driver issues, and I, I mean, they'll work. You'll get good audio out of some some nicer ones, but it's never going to be nearly as good as wired. I mean, it's significantly worse in most cases. So that's why I'm not a big fan of it. But if you really don't want that wire. Bluetooth is really your only other option for a wireless headphone. So, David Pickard says, hey, Craig. Hey, David. Welcome to the show. We're getting in our last five minutes here soon. So, Two Lucid Dream says, thanks for the Windows updating. Failure advice. A, a place I volunteer has the same issue on six of their seven computers. Well, this could just be a, a system issue with those particular systems. I mean, it could be a piece of software on there that's blocking it as well. If it's a, if it's a consistent problem across all your systems, then you might want to look at something that's common between all of them. Uh, and a lot of times that'll be an antivirus software or an anti-malware software. And sometimes those will block certain things from updating or getting accessed. So that might be another thing to look into. Neil Gard says, what happened to show number 12? See, Nate, I knew I picked the wrong number. Oh. <laughs> I knew I picked the wrong number. It's a secret show. It hasn't come out yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's the hidden episode. You have to look for it in my YouTube channel, and the person who finds it wins a gift card. No, I'm just kidding. Great. Now they're going to hold me to that because I'm going to rename this one 12, and they're going to say, hey, you said in episode 13, which is now 12, that you get a gift card. Never mind. Red1990X says, well, not a health risk, but hackers being able to use your Bluetooth. Ah. Uh, you mean for enabling and disabling Bluetooth. Okay, I see what he's saying. What do I think of Bluetooth as far as security is concerned? Hackers, man, it just depends on how bad they want to get into your devices. Hackers can get in through your your 3G. Uh, they can get in through your Bluetooth. They can get in through... Uh, what's a real popular one now? I'm trying to think. Wi-Fi is a popular one. It just really depends. I mean... What are you worried about them taking from your phone? Uh, lock it out with a password. That's always the first thing you want to do. Or, or the key number or the numerical keypad strokes. Uh, I haven't really witnessed anybody being able to do some significant hacking to a mobile device and grab that kind of data. But anything is possible with wireless. If you don't use it, disable it. you got nothing to worry about. But Bluetooth is pretty secure. I mean, it requires an actual key pin authentication from the device and the phone itself. So when it tries to marry the device to an actual Bluetooth device, you're required to enter a specific keypad or key pin number for that physical connection to take place. So they'd probably have to tunnel through an app of some kind to make that happen. That's a good question. Syrian Moon asks... I have Windows 7 and 8 on the same laptop, and all the settings are correct, and it's working fine on Windows 7. But on Windows 8, it just shows limited beside the network icon. Well, I mean, even if you're... This is the same question he'd asked earlier. He was having issues with network communications. Well, at least that verifies that your hardware is working, your network connection. But it doesn't really verify that your settings are correct. If, for some reason, your Windows 8 settings, it would show limited if the IP was not set to DHCP that would actually be a red flag to me because limited means that it can it's tried to establish communications it's attempted to connect to that particular network but it hasn't been able to obtain an IP address from the host limited can also mean that it's attempted to establish that communication and it's found a conflict so another solution might be to set a static IP address on your Windows 8 machine. To do that, follow the same steps I said earlier. Get into your control panel, get into the network adapter, and locate your IP settings for IPv4. And then you want to set your IP address manually to a IP that you know is available on your network. If you need, I don't really have enough time to go into it. If you need additional steps on how to do that, uh, just swing by the community page and I'll see if I can walk you through it. But if there's an IP address conflict on your router, that will also cause limited connectivity. Uh, so will bad Windows drivers. So make sure your Windows uh, network drivers are up to date as well. So, a few options for you to try. Barry Hollenbach, another question for you, Nate, asks, should a DJ use a wired mic or a wireless mic or if he or she is in a school gym? That's an interesting one. 
Very yeah. interesting one. Let me bring you up here. Yeah. All right, all right, we're good. Thanks, Craig. Um, so to answer your question, uh, Barry, I'm not actually sure what you mean when you say if he or she is in a school gym. Um, to me, that kind of seems erroneous or like irrelevant. I, I would recommend if I was a DJ. I've, I'm not a DJ. I've played a DJ on TV before. I mean, my friends have asked me to fill in and help at functions and stuff, so I've done that. But um, I would have one of each. I would have wired microphone and a wireless microphone. Uh, it really depends on on your setup. Most DJs are going to set up a table uh, near the closest power outlet, and that's how they're going to choose where they set their speakers up. Um, it's not the best situation, but more often than not, the DJ is going to be, you know, if it's, say you're at a wedding, for example, the the bridesmaid and the, the best man have to, uh, or the maid of honor, have to give speeches, and they usually don't want to go over to where the DJ is. They want to give the speech where they want to give the speech, so a wireless microphone would be handy. So I think it would depend on the function. If it's a wedding that's happening in a school gym or if it's like a school assembly, it really depends on the needs of the speaker or the performer. And um, it's good to have both of those technologies in your tool belt, if you can afford them, uh, to, to be more flexible. Always good advice. Flexibility is everything. Especially if you're a DJ, you got to be able to think on the fly and kind of adjust things on the fly if you're DJing an event. Yeah. Right. You should have, I mean, what happens if you thought you were going to be able to set up somewhere and then Bridezilla comes over and says, no, 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 he can't set up there. And now you're stuck in a situation where you don't have access to what you need. Yeah. And uh, you need to adjust on the fly. That's pretty common in event-type environments. You want to have a good set of tools, no matter what you do, to yeah. kind of have to fall back on. So, in, a, good, in addition, without being too long, I would say you probably want to have a, a good uh, extra couple hundred feet of speaker cable and a good extra couple hundred feet of power extension cables, right. um, just in case. Good question. Good question. All right, let's move on to the next one. What else we got here? Tom Wall says, faster, get an SSD. Yeah, SSDs are awesome. Solid state drives. For those of you who don't know, well worth the money if you can use it for a system drive. Uh, that means basically you're installing your operating system on the SSD. You're going to see a huge performance boost, especially on boot times, program access times, installation times, removal times. It's a lot more uh, reliable because it doesn't have spinning tape in it. runs cooler because it doesn't have moving parts. Uh, there's really, other than price, there's no reason not to go solid state. Uh, so definitely check out solid state if you're looking into a hard drive for a new system. Tom Wallace says, Waterfox, is that one of the uh, operating systems we were talking about from Mozilla? Like I know, that's kind of the great thing about um, Mozilla is it's open source. So yeah, there you go. The fastest 64-bit variant of Firefox on the web. Wow, Tom nailed it on this one. And obviously, the great thing about open source software is you have a lot of developers developing their own revisions and versions of that software package. And it looks like Waterfox is one such case. And it says it's a higher performance version of Mozilla Firefox. So, I mean, that's definitely worth checking into. I might actually look into that one. That looks like one I'm going to have to add to my website. Let me post a link of that into the community page. For those of you who haven't joined the community page, oh, look, his question's there, too from Charles Hole. I do attempt to post, like if we talk about a very relevant link um, in or a download or something in the show, I attempt to post it there. Uh, that way people can at least get access to it at some point. Let me type this out here. Faster Mozilla Firefox download. And I'll go ahead and share that. Now if you want to go to the community page, again, joining is free. It's pcmtechhelp.com forward slash community. And that's where we hang on. The, the show doesn't end here. It, it moves to the community page until the next show. So that's how we roll. All right, we're in the question roundup section here. We are out of time, actually. We're two minutes over. In the question, question roundup section, we attempt to answer your questions as quickly as possible so I can actually get off and go downstairs and play video games. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's because I have to get off. This is my prearranged time slot, okay? I have to get off as much as I want to stay. So let's go ahead and shoot through these, and hopefully we can get Nate in here if somebody asks a question, and he can handle it on a quick speed level. Hey, Craig, is it necessary to update Windows? Absolutely. They do updates for a reason. It's because a vulnerability has been found, and if you don't do the updates, there's a chance your computer can get infected, and 
Windows infections are not pretty. So yes, make sure you update Windows. The only reason not to is because you have a pirated version. So why did you ask me that question? <laughs> I'm just messing with you. But yes, always update Windows. Tom Proak says Pale Moon. That was another good alternative for a browser, I believe. So check that one out. I'll go ahead and post a link to that one as well after the show is over. Rev1990X says, I use After Effects CS6, and I have this plugin called Mojo from Red Giant Software, and it makes 30 frames per second look like 24 frames. Looks like a reasonable solution to me, and I'm sure it's not the only one you can get. After Effects is kind of pricey, though. That's the only downside. So, Lord Lightning X says, yes, he must have just made it to the stream. He says, Craig, do you know how to play sound in a batch file without opening wmplayer.exe? Wow, wow. I would guess you have to change the default audio device for the computer or for the actual computer to something other than wmplayer for whatever file you're executing. If you don't do that, uh, you'd have to do that through the batch file. If you don't do that, you can probably find a media player such as VLC that allows for batch file command execution and you'd have to execute that batch file from the executable, or ex I'm sorry, execute that audio file from the audio software executable in the batch file. For those of you who don't know what batch files are, you probably don't even want to bother at this point because they've gotten so, they're old school ways of doing things, uh, but really Microsoft's tried to do a lot of things to do away with them, but they're still a traditional way of executing software behind the scenes. And it works great, actually. It's very efficient. Syrian Moon says, thanks for answering my questions. Really interesting show. It's the first time, but I liked it. Good job, guys. Thank you. Hey, we got a good job, Nate. All right. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't drive the new guy insane. We can be proud of that. Sounds like a win. <laughs> That's a win. Pecom Fun Fan 97 says, how long is this stream? It never stops. No, it uh, goes on till. it's supposed to go on until 10. It's supposed to be 9 to 10 p.m. Uh, but we're over by like five minutes. Nature Nerd 1000 says Sea Monkey is a good Mozilla Firefox alternative. Look at that! Now we got a third one, Sea Monkey. Uh, but does that run on the Mozilla Firefox framework? I don't know. It might. Don't have time to look it up. Big Nate 84, the Zoom Q2 HD Handy Video Recorder. Is this a reliable audio recorder inside and out? Take the floor, Nate. Well, I looked it up real quick uh, and. It's about the same price as the Flip Ultra HD when it first came out, $179. You get what you pay for. Looking at it, it looks like it's probably a little bit better than the Flip Ultra HD, but uh, your ears really have to have to tell you whether it's good or not. Looking at the specs isn't enough for me. I'd have to actually hear it, and then I'd be able to tell you. So. It's fun. It's cool that you bring that up because it's, it's absolutely true. But you know what the great thing about YouTube is? You can usually Google or search, do a YouTube search, for that model number and actually listen to and watch demos. That's a great point. I, that's what I would do. I, I've done that. Uh, I, that's how I did it. That's how I finally decided on the camera that I bought. So, and, and yeah, you got to do that, man. Do your homework. You got the best research tool available right in front of you. So, X Lord Lightning says, I don't have an SSD. I need to buy one. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> Barry Hollenbach says, do they make wireless sound systems at, hang on, I'm thinking he's going to continue this question. Do they make wireless sound systems at, at... We'll never know. <laughs> we'll never know. Uh, I think maybe he was just wondering if they make wireless sound systems. How about that? How about you answer that question? At least we've answered something for him. Do they make wireless sound systems? Yes. They do. Do make wireless sound systems. Okay. <laughs> I wouldn't buy one, but they do make them. That goes back to the Bluetooth discussion. I wouldn't buy a, a wireless audio anything. Yeah. Well, wireless opinion. professional wireless microphones are actually very reliable oh, for okay. the most part. So we use them a lot. But um, I'm you not know, sure if he means surround sound or professional, like wireless microphones or... Pro uh, probably, probably... I don't know. Maybe you're right. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, well, what do you know what the what they use for those wireless mics? Do they use like RF radio frequency? Or yes. They use? Yes, okay. they use they use well, RF. That... And there was a there was a big uh, it was a big deal when they switched to uh, digital broadcasting uh, over the for the TV signals. Okay. Because there's only a certain amount of white space available, and right. like uh, the wireless microphones do occupy 
a certain space that's you know been designated by the FCC. So right, and that explains why it's actually so reliable because RF is is really up there. Yeah, so. cell phones aren't allowed to be in the same range as microphones and so on. So. Right. Okay. Hey, we got something good out of that. Um, Neil Gard says, good show. Cheers, Craig. Thanks, Nate. You're welcome. Xlord Lightning says, viruses used to be creative, like icons running away. Now they're fave AVs. LOL. Man, that would have been funny. I just don't know what fave AVs means. I'm so out of the loop. Ahmed Kasirli, hi, guys. I have a laptop, Pavilion M6, with... Beats audio, but I don't think it's a subwoofer. Make a difference, it should. Um, I'm going to try to translate that here. I have a laptop with audio. Probably audio is not working. I don't think it's a subwoofer. should make a difference. I'm having trouble following that one. I'm, maybe he's asking if he should buy a subwoofer for his audio device, and if that's the case, I don't know, is it a, it's a laptop? I don't see a need for a subwoofer. That seems like crazy. Unless you're sitting at a desk and you have an audio system connected to your, your laptop and you want like the full gaming surround sound, you can plug it into your audio jack there. Then, yeah, subwoofer mm. will shake your whole room. That'd be kind of cool. Just depends on what you're doing, I guess. Hopefully that was your question. I'm, I'm not sure. WMPlayer.exe is Windows Media Player. Yes, it is. What's your thought on the new BlackBerry Z10? Don't ever buy BlackBerry ever. Uh, I don't even know what the Z10 is, but don't waste your money. They are done. I hate to say it. You can you can write in the headlines tomorrow. Craig officially verifies BlackBerry's done, uh, but uh, it's they're not they're not going to make a comeback anytime soon. Thunderbird is a good male alternative. That is correct. Okay, that is it for everybody. Looks like we are going to let ourselves go. And uh, let's go ahead and break the show here with uh, saying that we do broadcast live Monday through Thursday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And the PCM Tech Talk live show is all about, as you guys know, the subscribers. So we just sat here and answered your questions. I really like this new format. It's really kind of cool to have Nate here the whole time. I never would have even thought we would have been able to do something like this. Would you have, Nate? Because we were yeah. like... Yeah, this is awesome. I'm, I'm glad you had me on the show. I'm happy to fill in whenever uh, whenever you'd like, so uh, just yeah. let me know. I mean, we'll have to do that. I mean, I'll have to make it a regular thing to have a guest on. It's kind of cool having people ask me and the guest question. That's kind of a cool mix-up. You know, it's like people might get tired of listening to me for an hour. No, so, no one would get tired of you. Yeah, no, yeah, on. no, never, never, no. Mm. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, but uh, stay tuned, guys. Uh, swing by the website, pcmtechhelp.com. Join the community, pcmtechhelp.com forward slash community. Subscribe to the YouTube channel, pcmtechhelp.com forward slash YouTube. And follow me on any major social network. Follow Big Nate as well. I really appreciate him coming out. You can meet up with him or connect with him pretty much on any of the social networks as well or to his YouTube channel where he puts all of his videos. Stay tuned to all of his future videos as well. That's at bignate84.com. And that will bring you to his website. He's got a lot of connections to his other networks on there as well. Now, remember, Big Nate is also at the PCM Tech Help community page where you can talk to him there. And uh, I don't know if there's anything else to add. What do you think? I think you summed it up pretty good. One of these days, I'll have it down. Because I always, like, I finish the broadcast, and I'm like, oh, I forgot to tell them about oh. this. And you know I what you need? Time. You need a tagline. Oh, you need like a tag where you open and close your like Leo Laporte like hey 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 like you need something where you're right, like right right I'll be back exactly <laughs> I'll be back now nah, see I can't steal one I I'm not good with taglines I'm not good with marketing usually <laughs> so all right guys have a great night and remember the show continues at the community page and everybody have a great night and we will see you tomorrow at nine p.m. All right.